Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the live stream of St. James Anglican Church in Costa Mesa, California. I'm Pastor Brian Schultz, and we're so glad that you're here with us today. You know, before we begin, we're going to have a time of prayer. And we do this because when we pray, when we praise God, when we, when we proclaim who He is, we literally change the spiritual atmosphere where we are. We literally are inviting the Spirit of God to come where we're gathered. And so it's important that we kind of get the spiritual territory right so that we're prepared to worship and to receive all that the Lord has for us. So let's pray now, praying that the Lord will transform wherever we are into a place where His Spirit um, fills us and is present with us. Father, we praise you this day that you are good. You are so good that you gave us your only son who is an incredible gift to us and has redeemed us and has made us your children. Lord, as we gather this morning, we just invite the Holy Spirit to fill our homes and our hearts with your presence that you would just be present in a powerful way, that we would be prepared to worship you, that we would be able to receive all that you would have for us today. Change our hearts, Lord. Come, Holy Spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Blessed be God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Together. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. 
Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen.
strong deliverer, our God, our God, you reign forever, our hope, our strong God, we praise your name. We worship you. We praise you because you're a God who doesn't forget your people. We praise you because you are faithful, because you are good, and because even in the lowest points of our lives, you raise us up. We praise you because you didn't abandon us, but you sent us your son. And it's in his name, Jesus Christ, that we give you all praise and glory and honor. We praise you, our God, and we're just here to worship you this day. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Let us pray. Oh God, your never failing providence sets in order all things both in heaven and on earth. Put away from us all hurtful things and give us those things that are profitable for us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the book of Isaiah. Enter into the rock and hide in the dust from before the terror of the Lord and from the splendor of his majesty. The haughty looks of man shall be brought low, and the lofty pride of men shall be humbled, and the Lord alone will be exalted in that day. For the Lord of hosts has a day against all that is proud and lofty, against all that is lifted up, and it shall be brought low against all the cedars of Lebanon, lofty and lifted up, and against all the oaks of Bashan, against all the lofty mountains, and against all the uplifted hills, against every high tower, and against every fortified wall, against all the ships of Tarshish, and against all the beautiful craft, and the haughtiness of man shall be humbled, and the lofty pride of men shall be brought low, and the Lord alone will be exalted in that day. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. The next reading will be Psalm 89. Please read responsibly by the half verse. My song shall be always of the loving kindness of the Lord. With my mouth, I will ever be proclaiming your faithfulness from one generation to another. For I have said, mercy shall be built up forever. Your faithfulness shall be established in the heavens. I have made a covenant with my chosen people. I have sworn to David, my servant. Your seed will I establish forever and set your throne from one generation to another. O Lord, the heavens will praise your wondrous works. 
and, and your faithfulness, faithfulness in the assembly of the saints. For who in the clouds can be compared unto the Lord? And who among the gods is like unto the Lord? God is greatly to be feared in the council of the saints. And to be held in reverence by all who are round about him. O Lord God of hosts, who is like you? Your faithfulness, most mighty Lord, is round about you. Your rule, the raging of the sea. You still the waves when they are rise. You have subdued Rahab of the deep and destroyed her. You have scattered your enemies with your mighty arm. The heavens are yours, the earth is also yours. You laid the foundation of the world and all that is in it. You have made the north and the south. Tabor and Hermon shall rejoice in your name. You have a mighty arm. Strong is your hand and high in your right hand. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Mercy, Mercy and truth, truth shall go before your face. face. Blessed are the people, O Lord, who rejoice in you. They, they shall walk, walk in the light, in the light of, of your countenance. countenance. Their delight shall be in your name all day long. And, and in, in your righteousness shall they make their your boast. For you are the glory of their strength. And by, and by your, your favor you, you shall lift up our might. For the Lord is our defense. The Holy One of Israel is our King. A reading from the Book of Romans. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness, because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time, so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also, since God is one who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.
This is the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Do not think that I've come to bring peace to the earth. I've not come to bring peace but a sword. For I've come to set a man against his father and a daughter against his mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Whoever receives you receives me. And whoever receives me receives him who sent me. The one who receives a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And the one who receives a righteous person because he is a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. And whoever gives one of these little ones even a cup of cold water because he is a disciple, truly I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Let's pray. Father, as we hear your word this morning, prepare our hearts to receive it with joy. We pray that you would give us eyes to see, ears to hear, that we would be softened to receive all that you would have for us today. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So this is now week three in our sermon series on the Epistle to Romans called God's Plan to Save the World. And I thought before we go any further, I would share with you some words from the great reformer Martin Luther on what he wrote about this epistle. And this is what he said. This epistle is in truth the most important document in the New Testament. The gospel in its purest expression. Not only is it well worth a Christian's while to know it word for word by heart, but also to meditate on it day by day. It is the soul's daily bread and can never be read too often or studied too much. Now that's quite a recommendation, isn't it? But it tells you just important uh, how this letter is just so important to us is, you know, as we grow in our faith and as we begin to understand what the Lord has done for us in order that we might walk faithfully with him. So let's get in it today. We're going to be uh, reading uh, today Romans 3. So turn your Bibles to Romans 3 and we'll be looking at verses 21 through 31. And I should say something about this passage ahead of time that we've read today. Um, uh, some actually consider this passage, this short passage, to be the crux of the book of Romans. That this is the place where Paul gives us a very concise statement of what salvation entails, of what salvation is all about. And so we're going to really get into this, um, really focusing on just a few verses of this, uh, because it's very rich what he's written for us. Now, up to this point, Paul has really been focusing on why why people need salvation. Because the sad truth is, is that no one can claim that they deserve to escape God's punishment on the final day. All human beings have fallen short. Now, this passage begins in verse 21 with a clear shift from what Paul has been talking about proceeding. And we see this in his very first words, but now. So, he's stating that there's a contrast 
But now, in a contrast, he's been talking about the desperate shape of humanity, and now he's going to be talking about the reality in light of that. But now. And Paul writes that apart from the God, the righteousness of God has been made manifested. Now, you'll remember in verse 18 of chapter 1, we read there that the wrath of God has been manifested. And we saw that the revelation of God's wrath meant that God was already judging humankind in the present time. But now it's not God's wrath, but it's the righteousness of God that is being manifested or revealed. Now, what is the righteousness of God? What does Paul mean by this? Now, this is not an insignificant term. Indeed, it's mentioned four times in this passage in verse 21, 22, 25, and 26. And so it's worth our spending some time really grasping what Paul means when he says that the righteousness of God is being manifested. Now, righteousness on its own simply just means conformity to a norm or standard. Okay, so in our society, uh, if we obey the law, then we are righteous. And so if we don't speed and we drive within the speed limit, then we're righteous in regards to the law. But if we do speed, which I know none of us do, then, then we would be considered unrighteous before the law, at least according to the laws of our society. So what does this mean about God? Does that mean that God is a legalist? That he's a taskmaster who always wants to make sure that everything is done right because he does everything right and he's going to punish us because, well, he's just that kind of God? Not at all. But unfortunately, that's so often our view of who God is. That God is just out to get us. Now, in the Hebrew context, God's righteousness refers to to his faithfulness, to the norms that he has set up. And those norms are called covenants. Now, covenants are, are pledges of personal commitment to fulfill a promise you know, within an existing relationship. So the most familiar covenant to us is, well, the marriage covenant. And in that covenant, uh, the man and the wife promise to be faithful as long as they both shall live. Now, our society doesn't understand marriage as a covenant, and that's why divorce is so commonplace. But God doesn't treat covenants like human beings do. Back in the Old Testament, God initiated a covenant with Abraham. In verses in chapter 15 and 17 of, of Genesis, the Lord promised Abraham that he would be the father of a multitude of nations, that all the nations of the earth would be blessed through his offspring, and that he would be the God of that offspring forever and ever. And he didn't require anything of Abraham except that he would trust the Lord to fulfill his promise. In other words, he unilaterally committed himself to rescue creation, restore relationship with him, and make all things right through the offspring of Abraham. So God's righteousness means that he is faithful to the covenants that he's made. And particularly here in Romans, his covenant to Abraham and to his offspring. God is going to be faithful to carry out what he promised. Abraham's offspring will be the children of God forever, and they will be a blessing to the whole world. God's righteousness is about his faithfulness. Now, much of the Old Testament, when we read the Old Testament, is about Abraham's offspring, the Israelites. And there we are told that they are to be a light to the nations of the world, that they were to be the, the ones that reveal the true God to the world. In Deuteronomy 28.1, this is what Moses said to the Israelites. He said, if you faithfully obey the voice of the Lord, your God, 
The Lord your God will set you high above the nations of the earth. Blessed shall be you in the city. Blessed shall be you in the field. Blessed shall you be when you come in, and blessed shall you be when you go. All the peoples of the earth shall see that you are called by the name of the Lord. It was always God's intention that, that his people would be a light to the other nations, that they would be a light to them. And it was through Israel that it was to occur. And unfortunately, the Israelites were not faithful to the law that was given to them by the Lord. They didn't obey the commands, and they ultimately paid the consequence of that by being sent into exile. Now, what Paul wants to emphasize in Romans 3 is that the unfaithfulness of the Israelites will not negate the righteousness or faithfulness of God. God doesn't change his mind when human beings fail. Let's look at verse 1 of chapter 3, Romans 3. And this is what Paul writes. Then what advantage has the Jew? Or what is the value of circumcision? Much in every way. To begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. And then he says... Well, what if some were unfaithful? Does their, unf does their faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? By no means. Let God be true, though everyone were a liar. Now, how is God now going to be righteous or, or faithful in regard to his covenant to rescue the earth and to bring blessing through the offspring of Abraham. So in chapter 1, you recall that we saw that the pagan world suppressed the truth about God. And in their denial, they pursued all kinds of unrighteousness. The Jews, although they were given God's law, had been unfaithful in keeping the law and unable to be a light to the world. Or as Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Both Jew and and Gentile falls short. So how is God going to be true to his word? How could he be faithful to the promises that he made long ago when human beings are so corrupt? Romans 3.21 is the announcement that God's faithfulness is now going to be revealed. He is inaugurating a new era. God has acted on his own to deliver and to vindicate his people apart from obedience to the law. God has done it all himself. In fulfillment of the promises to Abraham, he will save the human race and make Abraham's offspring a blessing to the world on his own. In verse 22, Paul writes, The righteousness of God has been revealed through his son, Jesus Christ. In what way? Well, he continues in verse 25 with, God put his son forward as a propitiation by his blood. Now, we've seen this word propitiation before. Uh, do you remember during our Lenten sermon series, um, we talked about the cross and propitiation. Now this word propitiation comes from a Greek word that's actually a composite from, uh, from two stems. Uh, the main stem means appeasement or consolation. And then the suffix refers to the location where something happens. And so literally pr propitiation means a place where forgiveness, atonement, or appeasement happens. Now, according to Frank Thielman, the word is a metaphorical reference to the rectangular lid on the Ark of the Covenant in the Old Testament known as the mercy seat. This was the place where God met with Aaron and Moses and where God offered reconciliation to his people on the Day of Atonement through the sacrificial blood sprinkled on it. 
Now, like the mercy seat, Jesus is the place where God reveals himself and where God reconciles himself to his people through the blood, the sin offering of his son. God has presented Jesus Christ as a gift to us. Out of his mercy, he has offered up his son as a sacrifice so that we could be cleansed from our sins no matter how heinous they may be. All we're required to do is to put our faith in Jesus for this cleansing. No other works are required. In fact, we can't do anything else to achieve salvation. It is all the work of God through his son, Jesus Christ. And that's why Paul emphasizes in verse 27, there's no room for boasting. It is all the work of God. Now, what a contrast to the world. What a contrast there. So Warren Buffett, the world's third richest man, announced on June 2006 that he would donate 85% of his $50 billion fortune to five charitable foundations. And commenting on his extreme generosity, Buffett said, there is more than one way to get to heaven, but this is a great way. The world thinks it can be saved apart from the work of God. But Romans 3 reveals it's all about what God has done in Jesus Christ. Now the outcome, the outcome of God's righteous or faithful act is now found in verse 24. So the, the Lord has done this. So what does that mean for us? What's the outcome? Look at verse 24. Those who believe in Jesus Christ now stand before God justified. Now, justified is a legal term it, that, that describes the status of someone when the court has found in their favor. It's the declaration of not guilty. Now, what is interesting about this verdict is that it doesn't tell us anything about the person's moral character. It doesn't tell us anything about his moral behavior that they've demonstrated. Indeed, a person who is a thoroughly bad character and who did in fact commit crimes of which he or she are charged may still be acquitted, cleared, or vindicated. You know, perhaps the most famous example of this in, in, in our memory is the trial of O.J. Simpson back in the 1990s. You know, many people today believe that O.J. Simpson did, in fact, kill his wife. The police believe he did, and they stopped investigating the murder after the trial. But whatever we think doesn't matter anymore. A jury found him not guilty. And in regards to that crime, Simpson is justified. And the same status is found with disciples of Jesus before God. Even though we are guilty of sin, even though we have fallen short, every one of us, through Jesus, we are declared not guilty. Not because of any moral virtue in ourselves, but only because of what Jesus has done for us. Justification is the declaration that grants us this new status. In Christ, you are justified. You are declared not guilty. Unfortunately, Christians who have put their faith in in Jesus often can't grasp that new status. They still can feel shame or guilt in regards to their past. They don't feel clean. They don't feel, 
They don't feel as if they deserve such mercy. In some ways, they feel permanently stained. Father Greg Boyle, who is founder and director of Homeboy Ministries in East Los Angeles, has put together a team of physicians who uh, are trained to remove tattoos of ex-gang members. And the service is crucial for the success in, in enabling former gray gang members to, to get out of it, to get outside of the gang. Gang-related tattoos prevent many former gang members from, from getting jobs or advancing in the workplace. For others, the markings put on them a, a serious danger when they're on the street. Now, there's no fee for this service that this ministry does. The tattoo removal is strictly a gift. And currently, there are over 1,000 people on the wait list to receive this service. The ostensible permanence of a gang tag to fosters an attitude that a gang's claim on a person is permanent too. It is a mark of ownership as well as identity. The emotional consequence is that the tie with the gang seems to be unbreakable. And that's the way so many of us feel about the past sins that mark our life. We can't shake them off, though we know we've been cleansed by Christ. Perhaps the imagery, the imagery of tattoo removal can, can evoke a renewed sense of our blessed assurance like former gang members who have had the marks of their former life removed. So our sins are blotted out by the blood of Jesus. They are remembered no more. If you've put your trust in Jesus today, you are declared not guilty. A verdict that is pronounced not just here, but in the heavenly realm. When you appear before the judgment seat of Christ, you will be proclaimed there, not guilty. I just want to give you an opportunity for those that have listened today. For those of you that have really never given their life to Jesus. For those of you that, um, who've never really trust him. I want to give you an opportunity to receive this gift and to put your trust in him. I also want to pray for those who have committed their life in some way to Jesus, but still carry with them the sin and shame of their past sins. So let me just pray for you now. Um, and I'm going to first pray for those who have never committed themselves, never trusted Jesus. Let's just pray together. Father, we just come before you this morning. We praise you for your faithfulness to humanity. That you are faithfulness to us even when we're unfaithful. And for those of us who are listening today who have really never given their lives to Jesus, I want to invite you to stand up wherever you are, to just stand up, And to pray this with me. Father, I confess to you that I have sinned. I have fallen short in every way. And you might want to even just take a moment to just say some of the ways in which you have been unfaithful. But today... I put my trust in Jesus Christ. Your son that you have given to us as a free gift. Your son who took upon himself my sins when he was crucified on the cross. I trust in him that he's cleansed me from my sins. 
and now I make him Lord of my life, a disciple of Jesus, who I will follow all the days of my life. Amen. And now for those of you that have, um, who still carry with you the, the um, just the shame and guilt of sin, let me, let me just pray for you right now. Father, I just thank you for the commitment that, that those that are here today have made in the past. And, and I just invite you to renew that commitment right now. Lord, I pray that as they renew their commitment to Jesus, to, be a, to make Jesus the trust of their life, to make Jesus the Lord of their life, I pray that they would know in their heart of hearts the depth of what was accomplished on the cross. That they are now declared in the heavenly realms justified, not guilty. That before the Lord, they now stand clean. I pray that you would break Satan's hold over them which tell them that they have to do something more, which tell them that they can never be clean. We just would pray that that voice would be silenced in Jesus' name and that the voice of the Holy Spirit would come in their lives. That voice that proclaims, you are my child, you are clean, you are not guilty. We pray all this, Lord, in Jesus' name and pray that your spirit would seal the commitments that have been made today, that you would seal the words that have been proclaimed, that you would seal in our hearts that we are your children who you love and who invested so much that you've given your only son to us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And now let's stand and declare our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, True God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the church and for the world, saying, hear our prayer. For the peace of the whole world and for the well-being and unity of the people of God. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For Foley, our archbishop, and Keith, our bishop, 
and for all the clergy and people of our diocese and con congregation. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our, Hear our prayer. prayer. For all those who proclaim the gospel at home and abroad, and for all who teach and disciple others, Lord, in your mercy. Hear, Hear our prayer. prayer. For brothers and sisters in Christ who are persecuted for their faith, Lord, in your mercy. Hear, Hear our prayer. prayer. For our nation and for those in authority, and for all in public service, Lord, in your mercy. Hear, Hear our, our prayer. prayer. For all those who are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For all those who have departed this life in the certain hope of the resurrection and thanksgiving, let us pray, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. I invite you to gather with those you are with to add your own petitions and thanksgivings at this time. Heavenly Father, grant these our prayers for the sake of Jesus Christ, our only mediator and advocate, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now let us confess our sins to Almighty God. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who have rebelled against him and have not loved him with all of his heart, have mercy on you. Pardon and deliver you from all of your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and bring you to everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Now hear the word of God to all those who truly turn to him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. Please stand. And so with these words of assurance that Christ has accomplished all that is necessary so that we truly are justified. We are declared not guilty in his sight. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And with, with your spirit. spirit. Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us uh, in our live stream today of our service at St. James. It's great to have you with us, 
And, uh, and if you are following this, if you are watching this today, or not part of our congregation, uh, we're just so glad that you're our guest today. And we want to be able to stay connected with you. And I just want to provide you with some uh, uh, email addresses that you can use. We'd love to get to know you. And if you wouldn't mind sending your name, your email address, phone number to info at stjamesnb.org. Um, that way you can stay connected. Uh, we can stay connected with you and you'll receive our weekly mailings. Also, if you have prayer requests, if you'll simply go to prayers with an S at stjamesnb.org, uh, we will pray for you, whatever needs that you might have. So uh, please take advantage of this. We'd love to stay connected with you. Just a few announcements for this week. Um, on Monday evening, we'll be having our uh, normal Monday time of prayer. That will be at 6 p.m. Um, you can receive the, the Zoom link in the parish uh, e-news, so please look for that. We will also be having a night of worship at 7 p.m. As, as Chuck leads just um, the congregation and, uh, and those watching into just a time of, of worship and entering into the presence of the Lord, uh, you'll have a chance just to, to sing and praise. So join us at 7 p.m. And that's something you can invite your friends to. As well as, I want to invite you to our second uh, racism symposium called Ri uh, Rise Up. Uh, we had our first this week, and it was, a, you know, it was a great time to be able to hear the stories uh, of those that, uh, who are amongst us, friends of ours, um, who have struggled with racism in their life and just sharing about that. This next week, we have a pastor and his wife, um, Carlos and Wendy uh, Guerrero. And they're going to be sharing their stories about how they were delivered from racism. Uh, he was actually in prison. He was actually uh, a hard uh, racist. And the Lord just delivered him. He has an amazing testimony. And you can be a part of that. Um, we're doing this really because the Lord uh, wants us to be able to hear each other's stories. The Lord wants us to be able to be compassionate uh, with others. And as we're compassionate and as we're loving, you know, we become one. We begin to identify with, with one another and we become one family. And that's the heart of God. The, the heart of God is for us to be able to, um, to love one another despite our differences. So please join us for um, our time, our second uh, symposium on uh, Thursday at 7 p.m. This is the time where we have our offering. Um, so please give. Um, you can give very easily right now. If you go to stjamesnb.org slash give, you can give via credit card or you can give via debit card. You know, giving is a part of our worship. You know, when we worship the Lord, we, we, he becomes Lord over everything, including our finances. And we give in order to support the, the work of the Lord, but we give in obedience because we are to give as part of being God's people. So give generously uh, today. This is actually the last week of our uh, fiscal year. And so uh, your generosity would be much appreciated as we, as we close our books um, this particular Sunday. So now walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us in offering and sacrifice to God. Thank you. 
about to share the meal that Jesus gave us. And as we come together and we celebrate this meal, we are being made into one body with him. It's a picture of our union with Jesus, that we find our strength and our identity in him and as a community who share this meal together. And this is why it's so important that we do this uh, every time that we gather. So the Lord be with you. With your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift, we lift them up, up to the Lord. Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is, it is right, right to give him thanks and praise. and praise. It is right, our duty and our joy, always and everywhere to give thanks to you. Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on the first day of the week overcame sin in the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened the way of everlasting life. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. And when we'd sinned against you and become subject to evil and death, you and your mercy sent your only Son into the world for our salvation. By the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, he became flesh and dwelt among us. In obedience to your will, he stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself once for all, that by his suffering, and death, we might be saved. By his resurrection, he broke the bonds of death, trampling hell and Satan under his feet. As our great high priest, he ascended to your right hand in glory, that we might come with confidence before the throne of grace. On the night that he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he'd given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, after supper, he took the cup. And when he'd given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith.
We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, and we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your word and Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Sanctify us also that we may worthily receive this holy sacrament and be made one body with him so that he may dwell in us and we in him. And bring us with all of your saints into the fullness of your heavenly kingdom where we shall see our Lord face to face. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now as our Savior has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our, our Father, Father, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed be thy name. name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia! Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast. Alleluia! We do not presume to come to this your table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your abundant and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord, whose character is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him, and he in us. Amen. are the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. And now if you have your pre-consecrated bread, we will share it together. This is the body of Christ, the bread of heaven.
Now, this is the blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. Thank 
mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of the Savior. find me all my fears and failures fill my life again I give my life to follow everyone I believe in now I surrender I surrender say Jesus conquered the grave. He has conquered the grave. He has conquered the hearts of gratitude, with hearts of praise for what you have done for us. We praise you so much for this incredible gift that we have, an incredible gift that unites a diverse body of people into the body of Jesus Christ, and we praise you for that. You made a people who were nothing into a people. You made a people who had no righteousness to be declared not guilty through the blood of your Son. And for that, Lord, we praise you. We worship you. We declared a delight to be your disciples. Praise you, Lord God. Now let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. 
and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory now and forever. Amen. And now by the peace of God that passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. Now let us go forth, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Thanks, Thanks be to God. To God.